know, it's been a staple of the Steelers' defense, you know, to, to stop the run and, and be physical and get after guys. And um, we know after last year that was unacceptable. So I think we had a, you know, a lot of guys that were bought into that. And I think we took a, a big jump in that. And we know we can be even better. There were some games that got away from us. Um, but we know we can even take a, take a step further um, in that aspect of the game as well. Hi everybody, MBC Matthews and welcome to Steelers Live presented by Unibet. Last week we talked about the Steelers offense and the various positions. This week defense and that was Alex Highsmith who finished with 14 and a half sacks. Let's welcome in our panelists to get things started. We have Dale Lolly of Steelers.com and SNR and his co-host on the drive, Matt Williamson of SNR as well. And uh, Dale, this might be a stupid question. Why did the Steelers underperform so early? Let's take out the TJ Watt factor on defense. <laughs> well, I think some of it uh, as well, Missy, was the offense allowing the def or keeping the defense on the field so so much early in the season uh, because they were still trying to find their footing as well early in the year, and so you saw more three and outs and things of that nature, and that, that put the defense in some tough spots. And you know that was kind of a carryover of what we had seen. You know, in 2021, uh, you know, where the defense was on the field for, uh, you know, long periods of time because the offense wasn't, you know, just, again, too many three and outs that put them back on the field quickly. And, you know, the more opportunities that the opposing offense has, the more chances that they're going to have success. So that was one thing that changed, uh, you know, the script flipped on that in the second half of the season. We saw more sustained drives from the offense, and that allowed the defense then to, uh, to get off the field quickly Again, complimentary football, you hear that term used a lot, and I thought that they complemented each other very well, particularly in the second half of the season. Matt, in terms of Cam Hayward, uh, I'll say it. He should be the Walter Payton Man of the Year award winner this year and also should have gone to the Pro Bowl. Was this his best season as a Steeler? Maybe. I mean, kind of to piggyback off what you asked, Dale, I thought Cam got a lot better as the season went on. And as a, a veteran that's played as much football as he has, I think that's remarkable. I mean, I don't think he was playing his very best that first month or so. And then he got to the point where he's been really playing for the last five years, and that's elite. And I don't throw that word around very much at all. And it does seem like he is perfectly in line for the Walter Payton Man of the Year with all he does for this team on and off the field for this community it seems like that's a perfect fit and he's very due and deserving dale some of the availability amongst the defensive line outside of cam hayward larry ogunjobi added in the offseason he dealt with injuries and when you lose tj to marvin liel the rookie got some more reps but then he went on ir what do you make of the defensive line and what we can expect moving forward to next season yeah, you know, there were there were a lot of different moving parts there. You know, they lose Chris Wormley as well at the end of the year, and obviously he was a, a big part of that. Tyson Alualu begins the season as a starter, uh, kind of gets, uh, you know, pushed aside, um, you know, early in the year. And, and, and so, um, you know, they, they've got some guys under contract who are young, uh, you know, who are, are up-and-comers. And as we've seen with this defensive line group, it does take time. If you remember back when Cam Hayward was a rookie, he barely played uh, because, you know, that was just the, the standard that those guys were held to that, hey, you're not going to get thrown in there right away. Well, that's kind of changed here, you know, more in recent years, somewhat out of necessity that some of these younger guys have been forced into action. And so, you know, they've also in recent years, you know, De DeMarvin Leal was their highest drafted defensive lineman since they took Stephon Tuitt in the second round in 2014. So they hadn't used a lot of resources draft-wise there. Um, so the expectation, you know, increases a little bit for a guy like Leal that, hey, you're a third round draft pick. We need you to, to come in and perform. And some of that, you know, his, his early play came because TJ Watt was out and he was playing that position. So he gave you some of that flexibility. So I, I like, some of the young pieces there, uh, the Montrevious Adams, who's not super young, but he's young to this team. You know, you have Liao, you have Isaiah Loudermilk, uh, but you also have Cam Hayward there. I mentioned the Lualu. Wormley is, you know, is, is on the wrong side of 30. What do they do with Ogan Joby? So there's a lot of moving parts there. Uh, they could certainly add to that position in the draft. Matt, what kind of jump do you expect from Liel? And also what would he need to do next year to make that possible? He's a really interesting player because the Steelers traditionally have not gone after that style of defensive lineman. As Dale mentioned, 
he played the outside linebacker role. He, he stood up in college. He stood up here at times. He can kick inside as a designated pass rusher on you know passing downs. But I, my hunch is, and you know, just kind of being around the team a little bit, that the long-term plan is to continue to bulk him up, kind of make him the Cam Hayward to it type three-four defensive end. But people look at this three-four-four-three thing too much anymore. I mean, more often than not, that's a four-man front with your two edge guys and two guys in the interior. I think he'll be on the interior. But he was promising as a rookie, but he only played 175 snaps. I mean, that's not all that much because he was down with that chart. He's a rookie and he had some injuries as well. Can they get him up to 700 snaps, 750 snaps? I think that's the, what you're prognosing with him, you know? All right, let's move to the outside linebackers group. And Dale, let's start with Alex Highsmith. Uh, based on what his performance was like, double digits was his goal going in. He far exceeded that. Did he exceed your expectations, especially not having T.J. Watt for seven games? Yeah, I don't think anybody, probably not even Alex, saw 14 and a half sacks coming. I mean, you know, when you're talking about getting the double digits, get, you get 10 sacks in the NFL, uh, that's a lot. To get 14 and a half, uh, that's elite. And so you, you look at what he did this year. He had already, he'd always been good against the run, setting the edge and doing those kind of things. I mean, he was, you know, a defensive end at Charlotte, so he understood how to set the edge. Uh, but, you know, consistently winning against opposing defensive uh, linemen or offensive linemen, I should say, uh, was a big step. And, you know, when T.J. Watt was out, you saw teams start to adjust their blocking schemes to account for him. You saw double teams shifting that way and things of that nature. That told me all I needed to know about what the rest of the league thought about Alex Highsmith as well, that he was, he's a guy coming off that edge that you do have to account for. So great season by Alex Highsmith. Uh, we'll see what he can do to build upon that. Um, you know, the expectation is once you do it once, you got to do it again. And so, um, you know, I, I certainly think he is, uh, uh, the arrow is still pointed up for him. I think there's still more meat on the bone for him. You know, I, I think he could be more consistent, but great season by Alex Highsmith. Also should have made it to the Pro Bowl, but uh, I'll rest <laughs> on that one. Matt, in terms of the depth behind Alex and TJ, what did you learn this season about that? Well, one other note about Highsmith, too, is he played a very high number of snaps this year. I mean, so he showed that he could be reliable down after down, which is very important, especially when his counterpart was out, which brings us to the depth, too. I, I thought Malik Reed was fine. I probably had higher expectations when they acquired him, just not enough splash. I'm a Jameer Jones fan. I mean, I think he's a core special teamer. If he's your fourth guy there at outside linebacker, I think you're in fine shape. But unfortunately, we had we saw too much of the depth with, with Watts' injury, unfortunately, and had to put people like Liao out of position or only have one outside linebacker on the field at times and do some unorthodox things to make up for it. So I think finding a third true outside linebacker edge guy should be on the wish list this offseason. All right, moving inside, Dale, what did you make of Miles Jack's first season with the Steelers? You know, I thought he was highly productive early. Uh, and then as the season went on, you know, as he started getting nicked up a little bit, had the, uh, I believe it was a groin injury, if, I'm, if memory serves right, that, that uh, really kind of limited his play over the last, uh, you know, six or so games. And, you know, is this something that, that uh, you know, is going to be a long-term issue? Probably not, but he's a guy who does have a uh, history of a, of a knee injury. So, um, again, thought he was highly productive, led the team in tackle, tackles this year, um, despite barely playing down the stretch. So, you know, I, I do think that uh, maybe year two could be better than year one, uh, but I would like to see him be, you know, be on the field more. Because of his physicality, his uh, will, his want to, we saw rookie Mark Robinson towards the end of the season a lot more, Matt. Um, what can we expect from him next season? Yeah, he's very intriguing because he's extremely athletic. He's very aggressive. He also only played about 50 snaps for the, the whole year. But as you mentioned, it was all down the stretch and sort of by necessity because of some of the other injuries and circumstances at the position. But boy, does he show up. I mean, good, bad or ugly. I mean, he shows up and he goes a thousand miles an hour, not always in the right direction yet. But I mean, he can get manipulated at times. But I am very intrigued. A year of seasoning, I think, will do him a lot of good next year, and he should be right in the mix. All right, guys, much more to talk about in terms of the Steelers defense here on Steelers Live. We'll do that and talk about the secondary, including Minka Fitzpatrick, the All-Pro, who tied for the league in interceptions.
I said, just the versatility, you know, guys being able to uh, play different different backgrounds, not just being labeled as a safety or not just a guy that plays around the plays around the line of scrimmage or a guy that plays in the post or a guy who's just a coverage corner or a zone corner. You know, some kinds of guys who just kind of get put in those categories and it's never just because of what they can do. It's just not it's just the exposure of what they have been to of, of that far or just within the defense. And welcome back to Steelers Live presented by Unibet. Dale, that was Cam Sutton. And I think having to have versatility was forced upon the secondary due to injuries. But we saw guys like Elijah Riley have to step up in certain games. What do you make of their performance as a group? You know, I, I thought it was kind of a mixed bag at times. Um, you know, we did see some big plays allowed, but we also saw a lot of big plays made. I mean, the Steelers tied for the league lead with 20 interceptions this year, which is great. That's what you want out of your secondary. Uh, you know, so it's cleaning up some of those, uh, you know, the, the big plays that they gave up. And uh, in a lot of cases, uh, when they did give up some of those big plays, the guys were in position to make the play on the football. It just didn't happen, which for a group that does make so many plays on the ball is, is somewhat surprising. So I, I do think that, you know, it, it was overall a pretty good season. Again, when you, when you have you know, the league, league in interceptions, you did a lot of good things, um, you know, so the versatility is great. Uh, a guy like Cam Sutton, a lot, you know, can play a different, a, a lot of different spots. Um, I would like to see somebody who is a master of one of those spots, kind of like Minka Fitzpatrick is a master at the, at the uh, free safety position. What about you, Matt? Yeah, a lot of the same. Um, the interceptions are great. The, the, they did create a lot of splash, a lot of game-changing plays, but especially early in the year when they faced top receivers, Pro Bowl type receivers, top 20 type receivers, those guys put up way too many numbers. I mean, they, they were um, highly productive against this secondary. But that calmed down as the season went along, partially because they played some very, very run-heavy teams. So it's hard to diagnose that exactly, but I do think that got cleaned up a fair amount. And everyone harps on, you know, the Watt injury. And of course that's huge. He was Defensive Player of the Year. But I think not having KZ for the first half of the year was huge as well. I mean, clearly that three safety package was a foundational piece for them. And they didn't have the opportunity to do that for much of the year. And the fact that KZ can play that deep middle where Minka's been so much just frees up Minka to be the total package. And I think that's a big addition. So Minka's versatility, Sutton's versatility is really key. And maybe they need to cut down on some of the outside production. Never bad when you can let Minka be Minka. And Dale, have we right. seen his best football yet? It just feels like every year he's impressing us more and more. No, I don't think we have. I think, you know, that safety position, particularly the free safety position, is one um, obviously, there's a lot of athleticism that you need to have at the position, but I think as you get older at that position, you think about the guys like the Charles Woodsons or the Rod Woodsons, the guys who, who do it a long time and are able to continue to be productive late into their careers at that free safety position because of what they have above the neck. And I think Minka above the neck is going to continue to get better and better and better. And, and as he does that, uh, we're going to see even more production out of Minka Fitzpatrick. Matt, do you feel like the Steelers should do their best to keep Minka Fitzpatrick and Terrell Edmonds together as that tandem because they work so well together? Yes, and I would put KZ in there as well. I mean, Edmonds and KZ are both up, and while you might call Edmonds and KZ both safeties, they're very, very different. You know, Edmonds does his best work slot against a tight end, near the line of scrimmage, more strong safety stuff, where KZ can come down in the slot versus the Welker types. You don't want Edmonds in that role, but he's better off, far off the ball with Minka being somewhere in between. So ideally, I'd love to see the three of them return. If it's incapable or you know the, the finances don't work out, I still think they need to prioritize three safeties that play a lot. All right, guys. Well, that was our look at defense Steelers by position. Thanks so much for joining me today. And thanks to you at home for watching. This has been Steelers Live presented by Unibet.